We had been in Nepal perhaps a year and a half, two years, when uh, just before the monsoon hit, we had a wild storm, lightning and thunder. One night, it was late, I would say it was uh, between 10 and 11 at night. Our kids were up in the attic sleeping, and uh, this horrendous flash of light, lightning, came so close, I'm, we were sure it hit the hospital. Didn't hit us, but we were only, oh, a few hundred feet from the hospital. Made a horrendous noise, woke everyone up. Well, we finally got back to sleep. But early in the morning, I'm not sure, don't remember whether it was daylight or not, we heard some horrible screaming from the hospital. Our son Malcolm jumped out of bed, ran down the, the stairway, the ladder, ran over, I don't know what got in his head, ran over to the hospital. He knew right where the main electrical switch was, and he switched it off, and the screaming stopped. I think it wasn't until the next morning that we found out, or a little later on, that we found out what had happened was, yes, the hospital had been hit by this bolt of lightning. It had done something to the electrical system. It shorted some part of it out. There was a man in the bathroom who would put his hand on the faucet to turn on the water and the short had involved that faucet, and he couldn't let go until Malcolm turned off the switch. Well, that was horrible enough. <laughs> but later on that morning, and I don't remember again exactly when, but it was after I'd uh, gone to work, and they brought in two stretchers. There were a group of men and a woman who brought in two stretchers. One contained a man, the other contained a little boy. Well, they were checked over, t brought in to the, the place where we examine patients. And uh, when I saw them, I was horrified. Now I'd like to back up and tell how this, how this happened, why they were in this condition. So we'll go back to their village, the little town of Cherowa. And again, I'm not sure exactly how many miles it was. It was up uh, to a corner on the Chinese road, and then down into the valley. And uh, at any rate, it had taken them, it must have taken them several hours of carrying these two people to the hospital on these stretchers. And what had happened was that a bolt of lightning had hit this thatch roof covered home in Cherowa, gone through the roof, hit a man and his wife, killed them instantly. There were two little boys in the family. They were both awake. One of them was about five, the other was probably about two or three. They had seen their parents killed themselves by that bolt of lightning. It was a horrifying experience. The bolt of lightning set the roof, the thatch roof, on fire and started going up in flames. Now in Nepal, if they have an animal, and frequently they do, they have them on the ground floor and the family sleeps up on the second floor, kind of a loft type arrangement. 
Well, so a little boy, after seeing his parents killed, decided to check on the animal down below and uh, see what was going on. It was a buffalo, water buffalo. Well, apparently, he decided that he would get up on the buffalo and then get the buffalo to take both of them out of the house through the open door. Well, before they could get out, one of the poles from the roof on fire fell down. But before that, I'm getting ahead of my story. A relative, the uncle of this little boy, had seen what happened. I mean, he'd seen the bolt of lightning, he'd seen the house on fire. He knew that was his relatives. So he ran over it to see what was going on. And what he found was the parents both dead. The smaller of the two boys was okay, and he threw him out through the open door. The other boy he found asleep on the buffalo. Not asleep, overcome by the smoke and everything. Well, while he was in the process of getting the little boy out, that's when this on fire pole from the from the roof came down and pinned them both down on the ground. Well, for for the little boy, uh, it went across the back of his leg, and it uh, got it burned pretty badly. But for the man, it had burned his leg so badly. When I saw him in the hospital, it was essentially charred. I mean, the bone, it was useless. So when I saw them in the hospital, uh, the little boys, like, wasn't that bad. But the man, I knew there was nothing I could do for him except amputate at the knee. So I told him. I said, I'm sorry, but the only way you're going to, I can't repair that. The only thing I can do is to take your leg off at the knee, and your life will be fine. You won't have to worry. I'm not sure what went through his mind, but I think what happened is this. When they die, sometime later, they will come to life again in the form of some animal, not as a human. And he thought, well, I don't want to be an animal with only three legs, so I'll just die. There was nothing I could do to change his mind. So I decided, he was so bad off, I decided I would drive him myself into one of the hospitals in Kathmandu. Maybe they could do a better job of, of reasoning with him, persuade him to get his, his, allow his leg to be amputated. I went in again several days later. He had died. He wouldn't allow them. I felt really bad. But back to the little boy. His burn was bad enough so that he had to be in the hospital for, for several weeks. Uh, very early on, Whenever the nurses came to treat him, to change his dressing, he would start screaming. So after about the second day, I went over to him and really spanked him. I said, you can't do this. I've never done this to a patient before or after. <laughs> He looked up at me, so startled. 
He never made any noise after that during his treatment. <laughs> Incredible. Anyway, he got well very quickly. And it wasn't long before he was uh, uh, running around after the nurses, trying to help them pick up things that they dropped or whatever. And uh, everyone just came to love that little boy. He was about five years of age. So uh, it so happens that our daughter, Connie, who was about seven at the time, was very attracted to this cute little boy. He was, he was just like, a, became almost like a playmate to her. Of course, her o uh, older brothers were, oh, let's see, seven by nine. Then they were about nine and 11. And uh, they were great fun too. But this little Napoli boy, this is something else. Now I should say, that when the Nepalis come to the hospital as a patient, they always bring a family member who does their cooking for them of their food. They bring food, utensils, whatever they need, and uh, they prepare their meals for them. And it has to do with the caste system. You have to have the highest possible caste so that all the whatever other castes levels that the patients are, they can eat the food. But if the food is prepared by a low caste person, no one except that low caste can eat the food he prepares. <laughs> so they always bring a relative, and we made arrangements for that. They had a place where they could do their cooking. Well, this little boy had had an aunt that had come and cooked for him for a while. That was only sp uh, spasmodically. And in between, it was up to the nurses to take care of him. So they would, they would do whatever cooking was necessary. But that was quite a chore. And with monsoon coming on, it became impossible. Well, Connie decided that she would help him with his food problem. So she would go down to our house, get some food, and bring it up to him. Only one problem. Uh, most of the food wasn't very Nepali. It was prepared for our tastes, not Nepali's. So she would try to doctor it up and fix it so that uh, he could eat it. And uh, that went on for a while, and finally, Connie said to, to her mother, Mother, why don't we just have him come down and eat with us? It'd be so much easier. And it was just a few hundred feet away from the hospital anyway, so why not? Well, that's what happened. So he, Danny would come down and have so we, this little boy's name became Danny, obviously. <laughs> so uh, our, our kids started calling him Danny, and uh, he came down to the house at mealtime. Well, after this had gone on, oh, and Danny became a, a favorite in the hospital. Everyone loved him. And as time went on, and he still wasn't quite ready to go home, he would... Uh, Go out, go out for walks outside and play with some of the other kids. And uh, oh my, he became a, a favorite. Just p kids loved him. Anyway, finally one day, Connie said to her mother, Mother, Danny's such a sweet little boy. Why don't we just take him into our home? If he can eat with us, why can't he sleep with us? Well, <laughs> this happened one evening. So Virginia took me aside, explained the problem to me, and uh, we decided to go to the other room. And uh, the kids were all in, in the living room. And we decided to go to one of the bedrooms and 
talk about it and pray about it, decide what to do. Well, we decided, why not? Let him come into our home. So, Danny, we came in and, and uh, made the announcement to the kids, and they jumped up and said, we knew you would, we knew you would. <laughs> so Danny became a very much loved member of our family. Now we could go on and tell you many stories about Daniel, but that's, that's all we'll tell about Danny. Anyway, Danny, just to briefly summarize, Danny was with us when we, time came for us to go home on furlough. We checked, found out that Danny would not be allowed to leave the country. He was a Nepali citizen. What we didn't realize at the time was that you cannot adopt an Amer a, a Nepali boy unless you have no boys in your family. If you have boys in your family, you cannot adopt a Nepali boy. Huh. Well, we hadn't really decided that we would actually adopt him anyway. So we had to leave him there and uh, left him in the home of one of the other missionaries took him in. And uh, uh, so Danny's story becomes quite complicated, but to make a long story short, just to briefly summarize it, Danny uh, stayed there in Nepal for some time. He was in the home of a, a missionary. We sponsored him to our SM training school. He w went there until uh, several years. After that, he got a job in Nepal uh, on the swift running rivers of Nepal that handle tourists. He was with in that job for quite some time. Finally married a Nepali girl and uh, then we sponsored him to the States. They came as aliens, but uh, they got permission with a green card and all. And uh, we brought them over to the States sponsored them to Weimar College. Within a year and a half, they were both working so hard and making so much money that they took care of everything from then on. We paid their tuition up until the first year and a half after that. They were completely independent. They've now developed to the place. Oh, his, his wife, incidentally, was a, a Hindu. But uh, within a year after she came to the States, she became an Adventist, Christian. And uh, at the present time, they live outside of Sacramento, California, the little town of Auburn. And they run an elder care home, completely support themselves. They have two of their own children now. Delightful family. So that is the story of Danny. Thank <laughs> you.